We are glad you're with us today. I want to welcome each and every one of you um, to our YouTube audience through Facebook. I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for tuning in. Like, subscribe, share. Help us get the word out there. It's good to see people in church today, especially because that's what my sermon's on. Um, last couple of weeks, we were doing a love series, and the last two loves that we talked about uh, storge and agape love were leading up to where we need to be as far as loving in the way that God loves, which is agape love. And we're called to love like God. And it is a work in progress. It is not something that is easy to do because our flesh holds us back. Um, the Bible says the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And it's something that we try to work on, but no matter how hard we work on it, it will not succeed because it is something that has to come from God. So we're called to love, which is easier for us in an earthly and heavenly family with Storge, which was my last sermon. And that is a family and a familiar love that you cannot have unless you spend time together. And that leads to today's sermon, which is the importance of church and being in church. We're going to be in a couple different verses uh, in the New Testament. So if you have your Bible, grab your Bibles. Uh, we'll be in Matthew as well as in 1 Corinthians and in Ephesians. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and grab there. Um, we will start in Ephesians. But before we do that, let's pray. We'll ask the teacher to be here. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for allowing us to come before you. I pray, Lord, that as we dive into your word today, that you just open up our ears, our hearts to understand that you've moved me out of the way, Lord, that the things that are said are of you, Lord, that anything that is a thought of mine, you just move it out of the way, Lord, and just use me in the way that you see fit to reach your people. We'll give you the praise for it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So the last time I was up here, I read um, for the Storge Love, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, 24 and 25. I'm going to read that one more time. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as we see the day approaching. When I talked about that a couple weeks ago, I was saying that we need to be coming together as a family of God so that we can have the storge love, the family love, the familiar love. But as the end of the verse there says, and so much more as you see the day approaching and the fact that we know the day is approaching. I said two weeks ago that we are closer to Jesus' return that day than we were yesterday. We are two weeks closer than we were the last time I was up here. And every day we are closer and every day the day is approaching and we need to make sure that we are spending time together as the world word tells us to do. To not forsake the assembly. And we have to spend time together in order to have that storge family familiar love. And love grows when it's watered with time together. And I don't care if that is a family love, or friends, or church, or husband and wife, or with Jesus, the more time that you spend with whoever that person is, the more love you will have. My best friend, actually 20 years, I've known Jason for 20 years. My best friend, um, 20 years ago this May, when I started at Medieval Times, we became good friends. We spent almost 40 hours a week together at work, and when he left, we still spent time together, and now he lives with me, and we spend even less time together because his work schedule is different than mine, but we spend time together. And because we have spent time together over those 20 years, I have much less of a problem going to him with my personal problems than I would a random stranger. And when we are not coming to church and not assembling together as a church, it is real hard for us to bear one another's burdens 
as the word tells us to do. Because you don't feel comfortable with the people because you don't ever see them. So we need to remember that the word tells us to bear one another's burdens. Jesus tells us that we are to love each other. And that's how we show that we are his disciples. And the best way to do that is to assemble together. In Colossians 3.16, verse there says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That's the first part of the verse. You can do that on your own, daily, by reading the Bible, by praying, by spending time with Jesus. But the next part of this verse is impossible to do on your own. It says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You cannot teach if somebody's not there. You cannot hear teachings if you are not there. You cannot admonish one another in songs and in hymns and spiritual songs alone. It's impossible. And that verse, if you've ever been to church, sure sounds like church. If you were going to describe church, that's the best verse to do it. You come together, you sing songs, you teach. That's church. And we cannot do what the Bible tells us to do if we don't come to church. Our first set of verses today is going to be Ephesians 5. So if you have your Bibles, Ephesians 5. And before I read this set of verses, there is, and I should have read it too, but there's a set of verses that describe the church as the bride of Christ. And now, knowing that, let's read Ephesians 5, starting verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself to her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are all members of his holy body, of his flesh, and of his bones. These verses are often used when you're discussing, discussing marriage, sometimes used at wedding ceremonies. And it is talking about how husbands should love their wives, how wives should respect their husbands, and Christ did it for the church, and that's who we're supposed to look at. But let's reverse that. If our marriage reflected our church life, how strong would it be? If our relationships reflected our church life, how strong would they be? If our family time reflected our church life, how strong would it be? And I'm not going to look at anybody. This is between you and the Lord. But if every time you got together with your significant other, you just scrolled through your phone, how strong would your relationship be? If every time you got with your significant other, it was only for one hour a week, how strong would your relationship be? If every time you had that meeting for only one hour a week, you were late to that meeting, how strong would your relationship be? 
And if while you were at that meeting and having time with your significant other or your friend or your family or whatever, you didn't even acknowledge them in that one hour on that one day. And all you did is show by your body language that you wanted to be anywhere else. How strong would that relationship be? Let's move it to worldly things. If your job was reflected in your church life, how long would you have that job? If you only showed up one time a week, would you still have a job? If every time you did show up, you were late, would you have a job? If every time you were at that job, you had no interest in being there, would you still have a job? And we treat church completely different than we would anything else. And if we were the significant other, how would we feel? How would we feel if every time we got together, we were the one just being ignored? And we are called to assemble and to be attentive and to be in the presence of God, to come and to worship. And when we are called to be in the presence of God, we should be present. We should be present. Matthew 18, 20. These are the words of Jesus. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Where two or three are gathered together. And we are two or three here right now. And knowing that we are two or three, how would we feel if Jesus appeared right here, right now? Would we be okay with how we are acting in church? If when we walked through the doors to church, Jesus was sitting in one of these pews, how would you feel? Would you walk through the doors and go, oh, man, oh, I didn't know Jesus was going to be here. I wish I had dressed nicer. I wish I had prepared. I wish I had showed up on time. I wish I had even brought my Bible. He's here. His promise, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst. And quite often, we don't think, because we don't see him, that he's here, but he is here. And while I am up here saying all this, I am not doing it to try to make any of you feel bad. I am guilty of the same thing, of coming to church and being Present, but not present. I am guilty of being late. I'm guilty of just not wanting to get up. All of us are. All of us have. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad. The point of all of that is that I'm trying to show you, because the Lord has impressed it upon me to show you, how important it is for us to be together, for us to spend time together, as one accord, present in his presence, especially as the day approaches. That is the point of this sermon, not to get up here and to make you feel bad. And when I was led to this and was preparing for this, I got out my Christmas present from my mom. I think it was my mom. It was either my mom or my wife. I'm not sure which. That is the complete concordance and it has every word in the Bible, every verse. And I looked up the word church and churches. And it only appears in the New Testament. But it appears in the New Testament, 27 books, 114 times. Church and churches. That does not include assembly or a reference to assembling, 
or a reference to church. That is the actual word church and churches 114 times. And I am not going to read 114 verses to you, but I'm going to read a few so that you can get it through your heads like I had to. The importance of being here. First one is in Acts 11, and this is verse 26. And when he, when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. This is not the first time church is used, but this is one of them, and I used it because this is the first time they're called Christians. The word church appears quite often in Acts. In Acts 12, 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constantly prayer was offered to God for him by the church. If the church in the early days was not assembling, they would not be offering prayers to Peter, who was in prison and needed the prayers. The next one is in Acts 14.23. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Not church, in every church, which means more than one. Our next verse is going to be 1 Corinthians, and this is chapter 1. This is verses 2 and 3. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you and priests from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, Addressing the church. The next one is in, Act, or in 2 Corinthians. This is chapter 12, verse 25. There should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, variety of tongues. We cannot be pleasing to God if we do not do what his word tells us. And we cannot love one another. We cannot bear one another's burdens. We cannot suffer with all of the other members or rejoice with other members if we do not assemble together as a church. And we cannot be loving like God, agape, if we can't be loving first storge, which is family or familiar love. They come in steps. You cannot jump all the way to agape if you do not have a family type love. It is necessary for us to assemble in the presence of God together as one body, one family, one church in order for the Lord to use us and get us to the place where we have agape love. And the only way we will get to that point and Jesus can allow us and use us and get us to that agape love is if we will do our part, which is show up to church. And when I was going through this, it started with church, and then I started down the rabbit hole, as they say. And my next sermon is going to be on the Sabbath day. And keeping the Sabbath day holy. And I didn't include any verses on the Sabbath day. Because 
as I started going down that rabbit hole, I realized I don't have enough time for the sermon to include both of these things. And so the next time I'm up here, we will discuss the Sabbath day. But there are people today who will say, I don't go to church. I'm a Christian and I don't go to church because the church is corrupt. Because all they do is take their money and buy fancy cars. Or the church just does this. Or the church just does that. And religion is wrong. And organized religion. And this and that and the other. And they will often... They'll often quote a verse. This is in John chapter 4. They'll often quote a verse because being used just like Satan did. Let me take the word and let me twist it to my advantage. And they'll say things like, I follow what Jesus teaches. And so they'll use this. This is John chapter 4. This is uh, when Jesus is with the uh, woman on the well, or at the woman at the well, meeting the Samaritan woman. And she brings up worshiping God. And this is a verse that people often misquote. And this is John chapter 4, verse 21. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. The hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is the Spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. They will take that and say, see, Jesus didn't say anything about going to church. He was saying, you can worship God anywhere. And like the very beginning, let me take a little bit of the truth and let me twist it. That's what Satan does. And if you don't know your word of God, if you're not coming to church, if you're not reading your Bible, you're not going to know. And you hear that and you go, well, yeah, that's, that's true. And that does not mean that church is obsolete. That means when I'm driving to work, I can worship God. Or when I'm doing the dishes, I can pray. Or when I'm at church, I can spend time with him. It does not mean church is obsolete. And they will use that verse and say, that's why I don't go to church, because Jesus said this. But without coming together in the presence of God, we will never be able to fully be used by God. And I am about to say something. I read this on Facebook. This does not mean that I'm unappreciative of our online audience. Praise God for them. Sometimes there are more of them watching than there are sitting in these pews. So praise God for our online audience. I'm not getting ready to say this unappreciative of them. I don't mean this as you should never listen to preachers on the radio or on TV or online. What I'm about to say is not saying don't because you should get as much word of God Daily as you can. It should every day you should try to get as much as you can. But what I saw on Facebook was watching church on a live stream is like watching a fireplace on a screen. You see it, but you don't feel the warmth. And my family over here, my in-laws, are down here. Because there's like eight feet of snow surrounding their house. And they're down here because it's cold up there. And I guarantee you, they would probably think that I got hit in the head and I had brain damage if I told them, well, just turn on one of them Yule log things. It's a fire. It'd be ridiculous. No, they need fire to stay warm. And 
if they had a big enough fire, I'll bet you that the little pot belly stove that they use, they would put a gigantic fireplace with a tree in there if they could have, because it was cold. And when you watch it online, and I know that the Lord has moved me in sermons that I have seen online, but how much more warmth would it be if I was in that service? Because while you're watching it alone, and the Lord speaks to you while watching or listening alone, it's the equivalent of the warmth of a candle. But when you are in a building, in the presence of God, it is a fire. And you cannot have that alone. And I have a quiz, pop quiz, of the 114 times that the word church is used in the Bible, who said it first? Jesus. Jesus. The same people that are going to say, well, over here, he's saying. Over here, in John, he's saying, you don't got to go to church. You can worship God anywhere. But the first time that we see written in the Bible, the word church is the word Jesus. Jesus saying it. It's in Matthew 16, verse 18. This is where... He's talking to his disciples, and he says, who do people say I am? Oh, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Peter says, you're Christ, the Son of God. Jesus answers and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The first time church is in the Bible is Jesus saying, there will be a church, my people, my church. And so if you look at what he said of you don't have to worship here, there's going to be a time and you only pay attention to that, then all the other things, all the other 114 verses that I was reading, all of those that say church, if you want to ignore all of those because I only listen to the words of Jesus, well, here it is. My church. On you, I will build my church. It's not the only time he said church either. And of all the people who used the word church in the early church of the times, the first times that they were called Christians in Antioch. Jesus is the first one. And if you know your Bible, when somebody says, well, he was saying this, you can go, yep, that's because he told them, go into all the world and preach, which means they will be worshiping all over the world in church, assembling in church church and we cannot do that if we don't go to church and if all the other verses mean nothing this one should mean something because jesus endorses church jesus said i will have on you peter my church built and he knew that they were going to assemble so of all the other verses if you only want to pay attention to one, that was Jesus saying, I'm going to have a church. You should go to it. And the people that say, well, I listen to what Jesus' words say. I only read the red letters in these Bibles and I don't pay attention to any of the rest of it. Okay, well, there it is in red. My church. That same Jesus also says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And we won't know that and people will twist it and Satan will twist it if we're not in the word of God. And if we're not learning the word of God, as the first verse I read, where we're supposed to be assembled 
teaching, admonishing each other, singing songs. That's where we learn the word of God. And Jesus endorsed the church. And if all the other verses are just man, then at the very least we should be listening to Jesus. Because it is important. And church is important. And we need to come and assemble. Because he told us to. But also because we should want to. Because we should want to. Because we should want to see each other. Because we should want to love each other. Because we should want to bury one another's burdens. And if we don't come to church, we can't do that. If we don't come to church, as Satan knows, as I said at the beginning of getting up here, if you don't feel comfortable with your church family, you're not going to stay to them, hey, I need you to pray for me. And you hold it all on your own. And you can't do anything about it. And you're not involving the creator of the universe in your life or your church family because you're afraid to talk to them because you never see them. And they feel unfamiliar. It's important. We should want to come. We should want to spend time together. And we should want to be in his word and spend time with him daily but we should also want to make sure we're doing it as a family, together. And that doesn't mean once a week. We have Bible study here, Tuesday nights. Women have Bible study every other week. We have church every Sunday. There's three opportunities to get to know this church family every week. And Throughout the week, we should want to get to know our Father daily, as much as we can, as close as we can, because he wants to spend time with us. It's important. So go. Go to church. Come to church. And when you're at church, be present at church, in his presence. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for allowing us to come before you. I pray, Lord, that as we go from this place, that you watch over us, that you keep us safe through the week, and you just remind us, you want to spend time with us. You want to speak to us. You want to just shower us with blessings, with your love. And if we're not willing to come into your presence, you can't. I pray, Lord, that as we go from this place, you remind us we all want to be in your presence and should want to be in your presence and we should want to come together and that we do love one another and we know that you love us. I pray, Lord, that you just watch over us through this week. Bring us back at the time appointed by the Father. We'll give you the praise for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for being here today.